Zayd ibn Haritha is from one of the tribes of Yemen. He's from the Qahtani branch of the Arabs, not the Adnani branch. We'll go back all the way to the beginning. We said there's two main branches, the Qahtani and the Adnani. The Prophet and the others are from the Adnani branch. This is the other, the Qahtani branch. So Zayd is from the Qahtani branch. And to make a long story short, Zayd's mother and Zayd's father were from two different tribes, from the Yemeni tribes. Okay, And these two tribes had a love-hate relationship. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. Sometimes they were in a good uh, agreement and sometimes there was a little bit of a fighting. So one day, Zayd's mother took Zayd, her name was Su'da, Su'da took Zayd to her own tribe. And it so happened that a small skirmish broke out right at that time between her husband's tribe and her tribe. Okay, so Zayd's extended relatives, some distant uncles and whatnot, they got so angry that they did something very cruel. They took this child, seven, eight years old, they kidnapped him from his own mother, and even though she's a part of her, their own tribe. But because in Jahiliyyah and even in Islam, the son belongs to the father, and the son takes the lineage of the father. So to get revenge at that tribe, they actually, astaghfirullah, stole one of their own sister's, uh, relatively speaking, sister's children, and that is Zayd, and they kidnapped him obviously without the knowledge of his mother, and they sold him into slavery, just like the story of Yusuf. They sold him into slavery. And this was to get revenge at the tribe of Zayd's father. Okay, Typical Jahili, uh, Jahili uh, antics. And so, Zayd was sold in the great grand fairs of Ukkav. Ukkav, remember, were the, the largest fairs, the largest souq, the largest um, marketplace, which took place after the Hajj season. So, Zayd's extended relatives took him and they sold him. And they sold him as a young boy for 400 dirhams. And they sold him to Hakim ibn Hizam. And Hakim ibn Hizam is, of course, the, the nephew of Khadija. And Khadija had given Hakim money and said, go find a young slave for me, I need a servant at home. And so Hakim goes to the marketplace, he sees this young Arab child, and he is being sold for a hefty price, and so he purchases this child and brings him back to Khadija's home. And so he becomes Khadija's servant. This is Zayd ibn Haritha. Now, when Khadija marries the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Khadija gifted this servant to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is now yours. He is your servant. I give, as part of the marriage gifts and whatnot, so Khadija gifted Zayd to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, all of this is way before Islam, obviously, right? This is way before Islam. Now, Zayd's father, his name is Haritha, of course, Zayd's father is frantically looking for his son. He's sending criers out, literally just like the story of Yusuf. He's going mad with, with, with passion, with grief, with anger, and he's spreading the news everywhere that there is a boy from our tribe. These are his features. Uh, this is how he looked like when he was a boy. If anybody hears of him, please come and tell me. And it so happened that during one of the Hajj seasons, again, this is all in the days of Jahiliya, somebody from that uh, part of the world in Yemen saw Zayd and recognized that his looks are from the tribe of Zayd's father. He's not a Qurashi and most of the slaves were from Ethiopia or from, uh, or from other lands. So this is an Arab slave from Yemen, so his features are different. And by asking him some questions, they realized this is Zayd. This is the boy that his father is frantically looking for him. And so when they returned from Hajj, they told Zayd's father, we think we found your son, he is in Mecca, the holy city of Mecca, and he is a slave to one of the grandsons of Abdul Muttalib. Everybody knows Abdul Muttalib. He's one of the grandsons of Abdul Muttalib, he's a slave to that grandson, and his name is Muhammad. So the father is overjoyed, he gathers all of the money he possesses, he gets as much money as possible, and the father and the brother, he goes with his brother, they travel to Mecca instantaneously. As soon as they get him out, they travel to Mecca. And they come to Mecca and they ask, where is Muhammad, the grandson of Abdul Muttalib? So he is told, that they are, they are, he is in the Kaaba, or he is in the Haram. He's praying in the Haram area, or he's sitting in the Haram area. And so he goes and he approaches the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Ya Muhammad ibn Abdul Muttalib, he ascribes him to his grandfather. You are of the most noble lineage and Allah has blessed you and he keeps on praising and praising him. Even though he's not even a prophet yet, but still he wants to praise him for another reason, right? And you are people of trustworthiness and Allah has given you so much blessings. Ya Muhammad. We want to take our son back who was unjustly stole, uh, uh, stolen or kidnapped and, and sold into slavery. 
So basically, the long story short, he says, this is the story of what happened. And Usama is our son, not Usama, sorry, Usama is the son of Zayd. I'm jumping the gun. Usama ibn Zayd, he's going to come later on. And Zayd is our son, and we will give you any ransom you want, but please be generous with us because we can only afford so much. Now, these are the days of Jahiliyyah. You cannot take them to court, you cannot, there is no, there is no law, there is no order, right? And, and power belongs to the strongest. And they cannot plead their case in front of any judge, any magistrate. This is the law of Jahiliyyah, that their son was unjustly kidnapped, now they have to deal with it. So they're willing to pay the ransom, they're willing to buy their, their son back. And so the Prophet wasallam said, is this what you want from me, that I, I, I send Zayd back with you? They said, yes, and for whatever price you want, we will, we're, we're prepared to give this price for you. So, the Prophet said, it is up to him. I will leave the matter to him. And if he chooses you, then I will send him back without any ransom. I don't need your money. But if he chooses me, then I can never turn away from somebody who has turned to me. If he's chosen me, I cannot turn my back to him and, uh, and tell him he has no place with me. And so, of course, the father and the uncle were overjoyed because they said, this is, what else do we want? For free, we're going to get our son back. And so they said, oh Muhammad, you have done marvelous. You have done more than we could have asked for. This is much more than we expected. And so the Prophet called Zayd. And we can imagine Zayd was probably around 25 years old at the time, roughly. So he's grown up, when he was kidnapped, he was 7, 8, he was just a child, right? And now he's grown up an adult, he's with the Prophet ﷺ for at least 10 years. He's been with the Prophet ﷺ, uh, and before the Prophet ﷺ, he's, he's been with Khadija. So the Prophet ﷺ asked Zayd, do you recognize these two men? And Zayd said, yes I do. This is my father and this is my uncle, I recognize them. So the Prophet ﷺ said, they have come requesting that you go back with them, and I have left the matter to you. So, choose between the two of us. If you want, you may go back with your father and your uncle, and if you want, you may remain with me. Now, subhanAllah, even in this, we find that the pro even though the story is so short, but we read in, clearly the Prophet had a fondness and a paternal love. He doesn't want to let go of this child. He does not want to let go of this man. And he's not, he cannot say no because morally they have a point. Forget the law of Jahiliyyah, the Prophet is above the law of Jahiliyyah. Morally they have a point, and that is our son is not a slave. And he wasn't born into a slave, he should not be a slave. So he does the morally correct thing, and that is, you know, if that's the case, then he's yours for free. But then clearly he doesn't want to hand over this person because he has genuine feelings of fatherliness, feelings of love, feelings of a paternal type of love for this young man who has been raised in the house of the Prophet ﷺ. So he leaves it back to Zayd. And he says, if you want, choose them, and if you want, choose me. He allows this option to Zayd. Instantaneously, Zayd says, I can never choose anyone over you. Can never choose anyone over you. And at this point, remember the process of not even Rasulullah. He goes, I can never choose anyone over you, for you are to me more than a father and an uncle combined. SubhanAllah. You are to me more than a father and an uncle combined. And I want you to think about this. Wallahi. And I'm saying something, might sound a bit harsh, but listen to me all fully. Wallahi, this is unnatural for a man to say to a person who's not his blood relative, that of course I'll choose you over my father. I mean, biologically the love that you have for your father is there. There are cases of people who have never met their fathers until they're 30, 40 years old and then they discover who their fathers were and instantaneously there's a love bond. Isn't that correct? Right? Automatically in the fitrah there's a bond of love. The fact that Zayd has pure memories, he's grown up, he's 7, 8 years old when he's kidnapped, he knows who his father is, and yet instantaneously he says, how can I choose anybody over you? Wallahi, I will say, this is unnatural except if this man is a prophet of Allah. Because the bonds of a prophet are going to be stronger than the bonds of a father. And the love that such a person will put in the hearts of those around him, Wallahi, only somebody who is a prophet or is going to be a prophet. And, that, and that's the case of this man, he's going to be a prophet, he's not a prophet yet. Only somebody who has that level of spirituality will trump the bonds of fatherhood. Because that's what Zayd did. Zayd said, I can't choose anybody over you, Ya Rasulullah. Well, he didn't say Ya Rasulullah. He said, and he couldn't call him Muhammad because he was the master, right? 
So he's not calling any name. So he says, I cannot choose anybody over you because of what I have seen from you. You are to me more than a father and an uncle combined. Zayd's father stood up and he says, Haditha, and he says, Oh Zayd, have you gone crazy? Have you gone mad? You will choose to be a slave in a strange land. You're a slave, you're not even free. To a man who's not even your blood. And you refuse to come back with your own father to your own tribe? In other words, again, as a slave you have no rights, right? As a slave you have no izza, no honor. As a slave you have no protection. As a slave you're a slave. And you choose to be a slave to a stranger rather than come back with me, your father, to your own nation? Have you gone crazy? And Zaid remarks for him, yes, I have made my choice. I know what I have said and I have seen from this man that which I cannot choose anyone over him. The way that this man has treated me and with the love that he has, I cannot choose anybody over him. And when Zayd said this, the Prophet ﷺ stood up, took him by the hand and went to this hijr that we just talked about, the, the open part of the Kaaba, and he stood there and he made an announcement. That's where you made the announcements. And he said, O people of Mecca, I want you all to testify that from now on, Zayd is a free man and I have adopted him as my son. So he is now my son and he will inherit from me and I will inherit from him. And so he became known as Zayd ibn Muhammad. And he did this in front of the father in order to bring some peace to the father's heart. That look, your son is no longer a slave. And I will adopt him. And I will take care of him and he will inherit from me and I'm the grandson of Abdul Muttalib. And he did it in front of the father and uncle so that they don't go home feeling lost. But, but rather they go home feeling an ease that okay, at least our son is now a free man and he is adopted by Quraysh and he is now a, a Qurayshi if not in blood, then at least in uh, the same respect. So the same izza will be given to him. And therefore he adopted Zayd ibn Haritha. And of course after this time he was called Zayd ibn Muhammad. And ibn Umar said, and ibn Umar Ibn Umar is a young man uh, in early Makkah, so he does not know of Zayd as a young man. He knows of Zayd already when Islam has started. Ibn Umar, uh, Ibn Umar, the son of Abdullah, uh, Ibn Umar is the son of Umar ibn al-Khattab, Abdullah ibn Umar. Ibn Umar said, we never knew of Zayd by any other name except Zayd ibn Muhammad. That's what I thought he was. That's how the Prophet treated him. I never knew that Zayd had any name other than Zayd ibn Muhammad until Allah revealed Surah Ahzab verse 5. And that's way 50 year of Medina, way later on, 30 years after this incident happened, right? Ibn Umar says, I had no idea that Zayd was anybody other than Zayd ibn Muhammad. Because that's how the relationship was. Until Allah revealed Surah Ahzab, and in Surah Ahzab verse 5, what does Allah say? Ud'uhum li'aba'ihim huwa aqsatu indallah. Call children by their fathers. That is what is no noble in the eyes of Allah. And so that was when the Prophet ﷺ re-changed the name of Zayd and he said this is now Zayd ibn Haritha and not Zayd ibn Muhammad. And Ibn Shahab al-Zuhri was one of the famous scholars of early Islam. According to his opinion, Zayd was the first person to accept Islam. Now this first person to accept Islam has been said of Khadija, has been said of Abu Bakr, has been said of Zayd, has been said of Ali. Uh, these are the, the, the main people that has been said of. These four people that has been said of. And so Zayd is one of those few people who it has been said were the first to accept Islam. And of course people have tried to reconcile these narrations by saying that the first uh, Qurashi to accept Islam of the adult males was Abu Bakr. And the first female was uh, Khadija. And the first freed slave or Mawla was Zayd. And the first child was Ali. So they try to reconcile these opinions. But still the point being Zayd is basically one of the first converts to Islam. And Zayd was extremely beloved by the Prophet ﷺ. In the days of Jahiliyyah, Zayd had married Ummi Ayman. Ummi Ayman was the servant of Amina, the Prophet's mother. And when Amina passed away, 
Umm Ayman was inherited by the Prophet And so Umm Ayman became the first nurse. She's not a wet nurse. She didn't feed him. She didn't suckle him, but she took care of him. Right? So she became like a foster mother, but she's not foster, meaning she didn't uh, breastfeed. So Umm Ayman uh, is, now we don't know how old she, uh, uh, she was at the time, but most likely she was a young lady under Amina, and so she's maybe 15 years older than the Prophet or 10 years older. So Umm Ayman is at least, we would say, 20 years older than uh, Zayd. However, this is when both of them were slaves. So. Zayd married Umm Ayman when they're both slaves, because as a slave you can marry another slave. And the two of them had a child. And that child was born literally in the house of the Prophet There were no hospitals back then, right? It was literally born in the, in the house of the, of the Prophet and this child is of course none other than Usama ibn Zayd. This is the Usama ibn Zayd, the famous Usama ibn Zayd. The one whom, when the Sahaba wanted something, they would go to Usama and say, why don't you ask the Prophet ﷺ? Because he loves you so much, he can never say no to you. You're the one that, if, if you go to him, you can, never, you can never be turned down. And they would call Usama, Hibbun Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Mahboob basically, the Hibbun Nabi, the one whom the Prophet ﷺ loves. Because he loved him and he loved his father. And Usama was like a baby in the house of the Prophet ﷺ, raised as a baby, right? Raised as a child. And so Usama has that special status of literally being born in the household of the Prophet ﷺ and being raised in that household. And of course his father Zayd was no less. And uh, when, the, when the Prophet ﷺ adopted him and freed him, this meant that he would have the same status as the Quraysh. And so the Prophet ﷺ, uh, encouraged him to marry his own cousin Zainab binti Jahsh, right? And this is of course shows you that he intended to remove all elements of slavery from Zayd. Because as a slave you could not marry a noble lady, right? So Zayd was a slave. When he's freed and he becomes Zayd ibn Muhammad to solidify this status, the Prophet ﷺ says, marry my own cousin. And that is Zainab bint Jahsh. And that is his aunt's daughter. Right? So my own cousin, Zainab bint Jahsh. As you know, the marriage did not work out. There were tensions there. And then this leads to another story in the fifth year of the Hijrah where Allah reveals in the Quran that you will marry Zainab. And... Um, this was the only commandment in the Quran where Allah performed the nikah. There was no nikah because Allah performed it. There was no need for witnesses because it's in the Quran. There was no need for any wali because it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealing. And so as soon as the and this is of course after they divorced her. Uh, for by many months after they divorced her, it was a tense issue and we'll talk about that. And we'll talk about the misinterpretation that, that occur amongst non-Muslims about the story. Uh, but this is Zayd's, uh, one of Zayd's wives and that is uh, Zainab whom he eventually divorced. And then eventually he married other Qurashiyat. So Zayd married many Qurashiyat and this clearly shows that after he was freed, there was no stigma attached to that. He was uh, a slave anymore. And by the way, an interesting point about Zayd is that any time the Prophet ﷺ sent him somewhere, he was the one in charge, Zayd. Never was anybody put in charge over Zayd. And he was sent on at least 10 expeditions. And in every one of them, Zayd was the commander. And this shows the status that the Prophet ﷺ gave Zayd. And eventually, of course, Zayd met his martyrdom, his shahada, in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. <coughs> Excuse me. In the battle of Mu'ta, and this was the <clears throat> major battle between uh, the early Muslims and the Romans. The Prophet ﷺ himself did not participate, but he sent a large contingent, one of the largest armies that the Muslims had ever gathered, gathered after the conquest of Mecca. And he put in charge of them Zayd ibn Haritha. And he said, and this commandment is unprecedented, because he realized it's going to be a tough battle. Zayd is in charge of you. And if something happens to him, then my cousin Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, the, the brother of Ali. And if something happens to him, then Abdullah ibn Rawaha. He put three people in charge, one after the other. And all three of them died in the battle of Mu'tah. And there was a vacuum for who would be in charge. And that was when Khalid ibn al-Walid, who was a brand new convert, literally a month before Mu'tah, right? So he's coming as an infantryman. The other people in the army say, Ya Khalid, you are the general well-known. You will take charge. And this was when Khalid became who he became. And he returned and the Prophet said, You are Sayfullah. The battle of Mu'tah, Zayd died. 
His own cousin, Ja'far, died. And Abdullah ibn Rawaha, another beloved companion, died. It was one of the most painful episodes in Islamic history for the Prophet ﷺ. When the news of all of these came, it was a very painful episode. Quran was revealed for them, which is no longer uh, recited to this day. It's not recited, it was revealed at the time. Uh, and it was, of course, the martyrdom of Zayd. Usama then was given charge. And Usama, even though he was a young lad, probably 16 years old, the Prophet ﷺ appointed him to go and fight the next battle against the Romans. And this is when he وسلم, himself passed away, right? And Usama's army was just leaving Medina. And this was when the crisis happened between Abu Bakr and Umar. That Abu Bakr, uh, Umar said, you can't send Usama, he's just a kid. How can you send Usama? And the Prophet ﷺ said, or sorry, Abu Bakr said, how can I possibly Take somebody whom the Prophet appointed and put him out and appoint somebody else. So you, have you gone mad? How could I change whom the Prophet appointed, right? And uh, of course, that's another uh, issue of Usama uh, uh, ibn Zayd and his own life and story after that. And subhanAllah, it is enough of a blessing for Zayd ibn Haritha that he is the only companion ever whom Allah mentions by name in the Quran. The only name that we have in the whole Quran, not even Abu Bakr is mentioned by name, but he's mentioned by inference. And this is Abu Bakr is clearly indicated, right? But there is a blessing that even Abu Bakr did not get. And some of the Sahaba said that had Zayd been alive when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, Zayd would have been the Khalifa. Because he was that beloved to the Prophet ﷺ. And of course Allah mentions in the Quran, فَلَمَّا قَضَى زَيْدٌ مِّنْهَا وطرا. The only Sahabi whose name will be recited until the Day of Judgment, the only companion, is this companion, Zayd ibn Haritha, Abdullah ibn Umar, the same one who said, I knew, I never knew that Zayd ibn Muhammad was anybody other than Zayd ibn Muhammad until Allah revealed Surah Al-Ahzab verse 5 and then his name was changed. This same Abdullah ibn Umar, once he went to complain to his father, the Khalifa at the time, Umar ibn Khattab, and he said that, my dear father, how can you give the salary of Usama ibn Zayd more than my salary? We're both working for the Islamic State, we both have a stipend. How come his salary is more than mine? I mean, you're my father, you're the Khalifa. How come his salary is more than mine? And so Umar ibn Khattab said, because he was more beloved to Rasulullah Rasool than you, and because his father was more beloved to Rasulullah than your father. This is the Khalifa and his own son. Because, and I'm giving him more money than you. Because he was more beloved to Rasul Sassam than you ever were. And his father was more beloved to Rasul Sassam than your own father, meaning himself. Look at the honesty of this man, right? Look at the honesty. That I know that the Prophet loves Zayd more than he loved me. How can I give his son a salary less than, or a less than what I give you? And this one incident, that Zayd choosing the Prophet Sassam above his own father and his own uncle. I mean, wallahi, it is just mind-boggling if you think about it, right? It is simply, you're, it's difficult to just understand. And this is before he was Rasulullah. I mean, at least after his Rasulullah, you understand there's a religious motivation, right? After his Rasulullah, you un understand psychologically. This is before his Rasulullah, before Allah's wahi comes down. Still, Zayd says, I can never choose anybody above you. You are more than a father and an uncle could ever be. Well, it's just amazing how that relationship would have been, how the akhlaq of the Prophet would have been. It is something that, as I said, it just silences us. We just ponder and contemplate. And this one incident, Wallahi tells us more about the manners and mannerisms of the Prophet than if we had many particular stories of what he did. Just this one incident of Zayd choosing the Prophet above his own biological father, it speaks volumes about who this man was.